Hey, I, I, wrote, I wrote some confessions for everybody, and I want to begin today uh, my message before I get to my message. I thought it'd be important that we make some declarations of faith over our lives and over our families. And so I, I wrote a few things down, and I'm going to have them. I'll read them, and then I'll, uh, I'll give them. To, then you guys will see them on the screen, and then you repeat it back to me, okay? As, this is not Catholic Mass. This is just something I really feel like this is something we need to do. Because the Bible says the power of life and death, the power of death and life is in your tongue. And sometimes we need to grab a hold of one of these confessions or all of them and write them down and put them on our refrigerator or put them somewhere and declare things over our lives. You know, Matthew, you, you, you read in Matthew, in uh, Matthew eleven twenty two twenty four, 24, he said, whatsoever things you say, speak to the mountain. Say it. Whatever you say, you'll have. And so I wrote some things that I want for you and I declare over you. So as I repeat them, the first one is this. I declare and decree that the devourer is rebuked for my sake. All right, some of you don't know how it works. But we're, I'm going to say it, and then you're going to say it. And you can see it right there, and you can read it. I'm going slow. You guys got this, right? All right, here we go. Do it one more time. I declare and decree the devourer is rebuked for my sakes. Amen. Number two, I declare and decree that I am walking through open doors. Number three, I declare and decree my prayers are being answered. Number four, I declare and decree that I am walking in a season of opportunity. Say it again. I declare and decree I am walking in a season of opportunity. You got it? Number five. I declare and I decree that I live in peace and safety. Amen. Grab a hold of somebody's hand beside you and just speak over them right now. I declare and decree that I am living in peace and safety. Number six, I declare and decree I will not fear. Fear is of the devil. I will not live in fear. Number seven, I declare and decree I will rule and reign with Christ. Number eight, I declare and decree I will activate my covenant of blessing. Now, you, you just, this is, just close your eyes. I want you to say this with me. God is making me great. God is making my name great. God is making my children to be great. God is making my nation to be great. God has given me the power to be a blessing. I will not be defeated. And I will not quit. Amen. Give the Lord a praise all over the house. Amen. 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 I want to talk to us this morning about the grasshopper syndrome. The grasshopper syndrome. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Numbers chapter 13. And we'll skip around through number, uh, chapter 13. We'll start at verse number 1. I'll be reading out of a New King James Bible. Whatever translation you have, go there, read it. Pull it up on your phone, highlight it, make it bold, whatever you need to do to mark it. But I'm going to read to you from Numbers 13, and you can follow along with me. And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan. I am giving to the children of Israel... From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. God's looking for some men that he can send as leaders. You are not followers, you are leaders. I declare it over you in Jesus' name. You are a leader, and God's always looking for leaders. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the commandment of the Lord, all the men who were the heads of the children of Israel. Drop down to verse number 17. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said to them, Go up this way unto the south, and go up into the mountains, and see the land 
what it is, uh, and see what the land is like. Whether the people who dwell there are strong, weak, few, or many. Whether the land they dwell in is good or bad. Whether the cities are, they are inhabited like camps or strongholds. Whether the land is rich or poor. And whether the, there are forests there or not. Be of good courage and bring some fruit of the land. For now, now the time of the season of the first ripe grapes. Go down to verse 30. Everybody pop down to verse 30. Verse number 30 through 33. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses, and he said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we. And they, have, uh, th and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw there in it are men of great stature. In verse number 3, There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. It's a grasshopper mentality. It's a way of thinking. They had been in bondage for so long in Egypt, building bricks for Pharaoh, that now that they had been set free, and now that they're walking on in their promise and going towards the promised land, they're moving forward, but yet inside of them, it was so deeply rooted and embedded into who they really were that they could not even embrace the promised land that they were standing there looking at. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the grasshopper syndrome. Everybody say it, the grasshopper syndrome. I want to break the grasshopper syndrome off of some of you today. I want to, I want to get, just get you to awaken to what God wants to say into your hearts, and I want you to change the way you're thinking. I want you to renew your minds, to be transformed by the renewing of your minds, to start seeing things the way God sees them for you. God's plan has always been a man. God's plan has always been for a man. Oh, from the very beginning, God has a plan that he was going to use a man. And I want to tell you something. He's looking for leaders. And you may have to be the leader in your home right now, women. There are women that are here. They don't have a man in their life, and they're having to leave their home. But I want you to know something. God doesn't see gender. God, God says, hey, you want, I, I want to see leaders. I want to see, when God's speaking in his word, you can grab onto what he's saying and say, that's for me. And I'm speaking to you right now, and I want you to know something, that God's plan is for you to step into leadership and stop allowing the enemy to give you stinking thinking. Did you know that if a child is the first person in a household to become a Christian, there's a 3.5% probability that everybody in the household will follow Christ? Meaning if one of our children, if, if, if you, your child brings a friend to church, and that friend goes back into kids' church. And during the kids' church program, they explain to children about accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and their personal Savior. And that child receives Christ into their heart. There's a 3.5% chance that that child will absolutely impact everybody else in their family and their entire family will come to faith in Christ. We, we saw it in our lives. We saw Destiny, who was just a little girl in elementary school, went to school, told her friend, do you want to go to heaven? She said, yes, then you need to get Jesus in your heart. And, and, and Hunter and Holloway said, I want to go to heaven. Destiny said, well, you need to pray and ask Jesus into your heart. She prayed that day and asked Jesus into her heart. She went home and looked at her mom and dad at the dinner table and said, are we going to heaven? They said, yeah, we hope so. Well, if we're going to go to heaven, we have to go to church. We have to ask Jesus into our hearts. And Rick and Christine and Blake, their whole family, came to faith in Christ, and they've been coming to our church since we started the church almost. Amen. But it's only a 3.5% chance that, that that happens. If a mother, if, if a wife, if, if a mother is the first Christian. If she comes to faith in Christ, there's a 17% probability that the whole household will follow God. 
You get a praying mom in church praying for her family, there's a 17% probability that her entire family is going to be saved because she made a decision to follow Christ. But if the father, if the man of the house is the first one to accept Christ, there is a 93% probability that everybody else in his entire family will come to faith in Christ. I'm telling you, this is, not, this is not fictional. This is fact. God's looking for some men to rise up and realize we are called to lead our families, that there is a mandate and a call over our lives to be the priests of our home, to lead in prayer, to lead in Bible reading, to lead in church attendance. I mean, I'm just kind of tired of the woman doing all the pulling to try to get a man to go to church. Are we going to church today? Are we going to church today? God says, hey, I'm going to rise up some men to send them into the, into the promised land and come back with a good report. God wants to raise up some men and some leaders. And the Lord spoke to Moses in verse number one, said, send out men to spy out the land. Touch three people around you. Tell them God's going to give you a breakthrough. God's going to give you a breakthrough. God's going to give you a breakthrough. Here's something I've come to realize, that people who have a promise don't always act like it. People who have a promise do not always act like it. You can have a promise in your life and have no visual signs of the promise being manifested in your life. If you've been around faith for very long, if you grew up in a household of faith, if you have a mother or a father or a grandmother, sometimes it's a grandmother that does it. If, you have, if, you, if you've been raised up in faith, you understand and know that somebody has spoken over you and prayed over you and, and decreed some things over your life. Huh? I, 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 I know I grew up in a household of faith, and I'm telling you, every time there was somebody came to the church with prophecies, my mom and dad wanted me right up in the front. They wanted them to speak over my life. I remember daddy telling me and people telling me, you're called to preach, you're called to preach. And I'm like, I have no desire to preach. There was no manifestation of that in my life. I had people in the church that I would avoid because every time they would shake my hand, they'd say, son, you're called to preach. I said, I hated that guy. I'm like, I don't even want to be around that guy. Every time I see him coming, I'm trying to hide. But he began to speak something into my life and prophesy something into my life. I wonder how many of you are first-generation Christians. Like, there's nobody else in your family serving God. You're the first one to make a decision of faith, the first one to follow Christ with all of your heart. How many of you? Raise your hands. Wow, amen. Why don't you guys stand up? I want you to stand up. Amen. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is a, this is a reality. Some of, you know, stay standing. Stay standing. You're starting to sit down, Gary. I got you, buddy. I got to stand up here for an hour and 15 minutes. Surely to God, you can stand there for a couple. All right, listen. I want to speak some prophetic declarations over your life. Because you being first generation may not have had somebody calling things out of you and speaking things over you and speaking into your life. And I want to do that. I want to do that right now. I want to deposit something into you. Number one, I want to deposit in you that you will be protected and safe all the days of your life. You and your children will be protected and safe all the days of your life. I want you to receive that for you and say, that's a promise for me. Psalm 91 says that God is your refuge and your fortress. He says that angels will guard you day and night. And I speak and declare over you, you have angels guarding over you and watching over you, and you will be protected all the days of your life. Number two, I want to prophesy over you that no weapon formed against you will prosper. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Isaiah 54, 17 said, No weapon formed against you or your children will prosper. That includes sickness, disease, physical harm, rejection, or any other plot of the enemy. I declare it over you. You will prosper and you will be protected. I, I just prophesy over you that you will not walk in fear. 
You will not be intimidated by fear. Fear is of the devil. It is not from God. And I declare over you, you will not walk in fear. Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You will not walk in fear. And your children will not walk in fear. Because God himself is protecting you. He's with you and he's watching out for you. Number four, every time you get in trouble, you'll run to the Lord. You're not going to try to figure it out, come up with a solution. Every time you get in trouble, you will run to the Lord. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are safe. And I declare over you right now, you will run to the Lord. Number five, I, de- I, just, I just speak over you as first-generation Christians. You will be a man or a woman of great spiritual power. You will operate in spiritual power. The Bible tells us in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you power to tread upon scorpions, serpents and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Number six, I declare over you right now, and I prophesy over you that you and your children will serve the Lord all the days of their life. I speak it over you right now. You and your children. You and your children. Your sons and your daughters will serve the Lord all the days of their life. I call them into the kingdom of God. I speak it over you and I bless you with a blessing of of, of salvation for your household. Joshua 24, 15 And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose yourselves this day whom you serve, whether the gods of the fathers are served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for my house, we will serve the Lord. Number seven, I just prophesy over you that you were blessed to be a blessing. You are blessed to be a blessing and you will pass the blessing on from generation to generation you will pass the blessing it began with you but it won't end with you it will be carried down to your children and your grandchildren and your grand great grandchildren in Jesus name if you receive that give the Lord a praise everybody you can be seated amen you have a promise you can be seated You have a promise. I have a promise. We have a promise. Now everybody in this room has a promise. The children of Israel had a promise that the land would be flowing with milk and honey. But they were stuck in bondage and they were making bricks. Anybody ever been stuck? Come on. I've been stuck. I've been following the Lord and get into a place where I'm just stuck. And they had this promise inside of them, but they were stuck. You can have a promise and not have any evidence of it. Because many times a promise will not come to pass without a little drama. Huh? You got a promise for your household, darling. and you're holding it, and you're declaring, I'm declaring over my husband, my children, but let me tell you something. There's drama in the middle of all this. Sometimes it's messy in the middle. But you got to hold to the promise, and you got to stand up every day, square your shoulders and say, it don't look like it, it don't feel like it, but as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Huh? I can't see it. It ain't manifested. It don't feel right. But it's going to happen because God said it, and if God said it, that settles it. Amen. The picture of God's children living in Egypt in bondage and being delivered into the promised land is the picture of God exposing what had to be done to deal with a grasshopper syndrome. Like something had to be done to deal with that thing that was rooted and and embedded into their lives. To think that... The thing about bondage is you can be in a bad situation so long that you begin to believe things can never change. Because you've just been in it so long. It hasn't happened, and you've been waiting and waiting. So now all of a sudden, that stuff starts getting deep into your life. And you can be on the edge of the promised land, on the edge of walking into what God had prepared, and still in your mind believe, we can't do this. 
I can't do this. I could never be successful. My business could never become a multi-billion dollar industry because I'm just not that smart and I don't have enough education. And, and, and it's a lie of the enemy. And I'm not just talking about financial blessings. I'm talking about your marriage. It's like you've been in such a yucky marriage for so long. You, you just honestly believe your husband or your wife is never going to change. And I'm telling you, that is a lie. That's, that's a grasshopper mentality that your situation can't be turned around. I mean, stuff just gets rooted, embedded into our lives. Hey, I would probably be an amazing singer right now, but, it, but I'm getting hot. Listen, when I was a little kid, Jim, my mom and dad had raised me in church. And when I was a little kid, I had it. They, they would always ask me to go up and sing. So I go up to the platform to sing. And I'd stand there and start singing. And I was beginning to think I was a pretty good singer. I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. But if I'd have kept doing it, if I'd have kept with it, I would have got training. I'd have become, I would have been an amazing singer. But still to this day, I can't sing. Because when I was a little kid, I was up there singing on a Sunday night. And everybody's just clapping. They're so happy. And my mom is just waving at me. And I'm trying to sing. And I'm trying not to look at her. Because I don't know what she wants. And she's waving at me. And I'm singing Jesus Loves Me. I'm about five or six years old. I'm nailing it, man. I'm getting to the big part. Everybody's going to get on their feet and start clapping. And my mom's just waving at me. And I finish the song. And I come off the platform. And my mom says, your zipper was down. <laughs> I said, What? Your zipper, your zipper was down. I never sung again. I ain't getting up there. It's not my calling. And every time that man would walk by me and he'd say, Brother Greg, I just want to tell you, you're called to preach and you're going to preach someday. I'm like, no, no, no. Last time I got up there, my zipper was down. I'm not getting up there no more. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. It got so embedded into me. I was afraid to get up and speak in front of people. It was a lie of the enemy. It was a grasshopper syndrome that got embedded into my life that I couldn't do it. I mean, I've told this story before, man. I, I wanted to get in the band. I wanted to get in the marching band because they had cool shoes and that uniform with the thing, the straps around and stuff. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to get in the band. So I got in the band. I joined the band. My mom and dad bought me a trombone. I wanted to play drums, but they had too many drummers. So I got a trombone. I don't want to play a trombone. That, that's geeky you know it's a geek to me the, the band people but I like the shoes and I like the the thing so I got in the band I made it all the way through Sheldon I'm like I, I did it in, in like sixth grade I got in the band I got to junior high I got in the band the band director I remember her today her name was Mrs. Pettit and Mrs. Pettit was a great band teacher and, and we would go and I got to invited to go to get in the parades and that's what I always wanted to do was march in the parade so I have my trombone and I'm marching in the parade I would I mean I didn't know how to play the stupid thing I, would, I, I, would, I just wanted to march in there. You guys are laughing, man, but it's the truth. And, and one day, we were in band rehearsal, and we're in this little smaller room about, you know, in, in, and everybody says, Miss Pettit says, okay, everybody play the fifth stanza. And I went, I'm watching my boys over here. When they go out, I'm going out. If they come in, I'm coming in. I'm just a little bit behind everybody. But I'm trying to keep up because I like the shoes and the coat, and I like marching in the band. And one day, Mrs. Pettit says to me, she says, Greg, stand up and play, play that, that stanza. I went, huh? She said, I want you to stand up and play that stanza. And I said, Mrs. Pettit, I, I, can't, I can't see good today. My... She said, no, stand up. And I stood up, and I went, ah! I said, I just can't see it today, Mrs. Pettit. I don't feel good. She said, okay, you can sit down. And after the class, Mrs. Pettit called me to her office, and she said, you can't play, can you? I said, no. <laughs> but I like the shoes, and I like to put marks in the band. She said, well, you're not going to be able to play in the band anymore. And I said, okay. She said, but if you keep practicing, we'll give you a tryout later. You can try it again. But what that did was it deeply embedded something into my heart that I couldn't be successful. 
And every time in my life that I started taking a step forward, it's like the enemy would say, that's going to get exposed. You can't do that. You can't grow the church to where it is today. You can't lead that many people. One man can't lead that many people. And the lies of the enemy keep trying to keep me embedded into a grasshopper mentality when God says, no, no, no. You are not who they want you to be. You're who I want you to be. And I called you. They didn't call you. And I want to just tell everybody in this room that the enemy is trying to hold you back with a grasshopper mentality and there's nothing you can't do if you put your heart to it if you square your shoulders and say God you called me and I will accomplish great things in your name amen it's these lies of the enemy that just try to infiltrate our hearts you think divorce is about you it isn't about you. It's about the enemy trying to get embedded into the hearts of the children to make them think that, it, that it, when it gets tough, they won't be able to make it either. It's a lie of the enemy. And we got to expose the lies and say, you know what? I am not a grasshopper, and you won't see me as a grasshopper. I may not be perfect, but I am walking in the blessing of the Lord, and there is nothing that is impossible to my God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, and I am not a grasshopper. Come on. Sometimes that stuff can get so deep and that grasshopper syndrome can get so embedded into your life. It's not as much about what happened to you physically. It's what happens to you psychologically. Like it, sometimes, you know, you, you meet a, a, a person that's been abused as a child. And you think, well, they should be over it by now. They are over the physical, you know, they're over that. But there's this psychological thing embedded into their heart that they don't trust anybody anymore. It's the plans of the enemy to keep you with a grasshopper mentality. You are not a victim. You are a victor. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. The children of Israel had developed a grasshopper syndrome. They had been trying to do things for themselves, and they have been trying to just get through this, and it, that's why God had to do things for them that they couldn't do for themselves. He was trying to break that mentality off of them. They knew they had a promise, but they couldn't embrace it. They couldn't grab it because of the grasshopper syndrome. God just didn't want to bring them out of bondage. He wanted to bring them out into victory so they could be his chosen people. He said, you're my chosen people. You're to live in the land that flows with milk and honey. So God started doing amazing things for them. Like he let them go through the plagues. You, you just think about the plagues. Ten plagues. You think flies and lice would have been enough. Like the whole place is infected with flies, you got no flies. Lice everywhere, but you got no lice. You think that would have been enough, but this stuff gets embedded so deep, God had to keep bringing them into situations where he was proving to them and showing them that I am the God of your promise. And I have more than enough to meet every need. They go through, they got, a, they got a pillar of fire by day. I mean, by night. It's like they're trying to sleep in their cold. God says, I'll give you a pillar of fire. I'll keep you warm at night. I'll give you a cloud by day. So wherever you go, there'll be a cloud covering you from the heat, and you won't have to worry about the heat. I'll give you manna from heaven. I'll feed you every day with manna from heaven. Food of angels, I'll bring it and I'll give it to you. He says to them, I'll give you water out of a rock. What was he giving them so many miracles and so many signs for? He was proving to them, I am the God of more than enough. I can supply everything you need. And it may take me a little while, but I'm going to get it down into your spirit that you are not a grasshopper. God wanted them to know that the God that gave them the promise was able to deliver the promise. They refused to go into the promised land because of the grasshopper syndrome. The opinion of our men becomes the inheritance of our children. How you see things is going to affect your children. Do you see them as successful? Do you see God doing great things for you? Can you see the blessing of God coming upon your family? How we as leaders, male or female, 
How we, how we see things will determine what our children believe. The grasshopper complex gets interwoven into a person, into their psychology, into their makeup, into the, their character of who they are, that no matter what God does for them, they cannot see themselves the way that God sees them. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and 7, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. No matter what kind of opportunities God brings to you, you will sabotage it if you don't see things the way God sees it. He'll just give you opportunity after opportunity, and you'll keep living with lack and, and, and defeat until you see yourself the way that God sees you. We have to destroy the grasshopper syndrome. We have to drive out insecurities and guilt and shame. The grasshopper syndrome sees giants and says we're not able. Joshua and Caleb see the same giants and say we are able. The only thing, the difference between a, a grasshopper syndrome and a land possessor is what you're putting in front of Abel. We are not able, we are able. They spent 40 years in the wilderness and actually died in the wilderness because of a grasshopper syndrome. Egypt was a system that represented containment. That bondage that they were living in, it represented containment. It, it represented walled cities. It, it wasn't the land that was flowing. God said, I want to take you to a land that's flowing. God wants you and I to begin to flow in the Holy Spirit, to move in the river of God and not live in containment and not think that this is all there is. There's so much more than what we're living with right now. There's so much more for you and I to experience. God wants you to become flowing. All right, I'm going to give you a few things, and uh, I'll try to hurry. I'm going to give you a few things that the grasshopper syndrome does for you, okay? Here's a few things that the grasshopper syndrome does for you. A grasshopper sy syndrome deprives you of vision. When you, have, when you have the wrong thinking, it will deprive you of vision. Listen, vision is the ability to see further than the eyes can see. You got... The Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. When you don't have a vision for your life and your future, when the enemy gives you a grasshopper mentality that all you see is what you're dealing with right now, the drama that you're in right now, the, 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 the experience that you're having right now, if, you, if you're only seeing that, you have a grasshopper mentality. Our young people are committing suicide every day because they have nothing to live for. They can't see anything beyond their circumstance. And they feel so hopeless. Do you realize you could be standing on the edge of your promise, looking at it face to face, and, and walk away from it because you don't have vision? They didn't meet with any of those giants. They didn't go talk to any of those giants. They didn't talk to any of those people, see how strong they were. They saw all the people, they saw the giants, and they formed their own opinion and said, hey, you know what, they're bigger than we are, they're stronger than we are, we can't do it. No vision. It doesn't always have to be that way. God can change every situation. Number two, a grasshopper syndrome will keep you from believing in leadership. I'm not going to tell you I'm perfect, but I'm going to tell you something. A grasshopper mentality will keep you from believing in leadership. They didn't trust Moses. God raised Moses up, made him a deliverer. He even told him, I'm going to send you a deliverer. God sends Moses, and he speaks the truth to them, and they doubted, and they just did not trust Moses. They actually said in Numbers 14, they actually said, are you going to be like the other one? Are you going to be like the other princes? Are you going to be that kind of a leader for us? Because if, if that's the way it is, we'll just go back. They didn't trust Moses. Because the grasshopper syndrome has been so embedded into their soul, they couldn't embrace the leadership of Moses. A part of the grasshopper uh, uh, syndrome is this. It'll make you think that people that are for you are against you, and it'll make you think that people that are against you are for you. As a parent, I know what that looks like. 
I'm trying to protect my son and lead him into a place. And, you know, back years ago when he first graduated high school, Bobby and I were trying to guide him and lead him. And he was like, he was listening to other people who were not for him more than he was listening to a father that was for him. Y'all can relate. If you got kids, you know what I'm talking about. You try to help a drug addict one time. You, 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 you get involved in, 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 in ministering to a drug addict. It'll be, it won't be long until that drug addict is going to accuse you of trying to be their problem. Like somehow you trying to rescue, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? you like sometimes you're trying to res- rescue somebody that's hurting, and all of a sudden they're blaming you like you, you're, the, you're the issue. And looking to somebody who's absolutely got wrong motives, trying to manipulate them and steal from them, and they believe they're the friend that's going to help them. That's a grasshopper mentality. You need to get around the right people. I say all the time, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. A grasshopper mentality gravitates to the wrong people. When you have right thinking, you're looking for somebody that can promote you in a minute. See, I want to be around people that can bless me, like, in a minute. Like, I want to surround myself with people that I can be a blessing to. Huh? You got to get the right friends and the right people in your life. You need to surround yourself with people that can help you. Number three, I'm trying to move. A grasshopper mentality destroys the sense of community. When you have a grasshopper mentality, you will isolate yourself. Or you'll begin, to, you, you'll begin to form a tribe, and you and your tribe will pull away from everybody, and like you guys got the answer, and everybody else is going in the wrong direction. It destroys the sense of community. A grasshopper mentality believes everybody's against us. Believe everything is a sense of competition. The purpose of God providing for them in the wilderness was to let them know that he had enough for everybody. A grasshopper mentality doesn't celebrate another person's victories, but is always looking for their own victories. I want to champion other people. I want to celebrate what God's doing in other people's lives. Number four, a grasshopper mentality is motivated by anger and fear. You know what a grasshopper mentality is? It's a negative spirit. There's people, no matter what you talk to them about, they come up with a negative response to everything you say. Boy, the sky is so blue. Well, it's not really blue. That's gray, Pastor. There's like a little bit of a gray tint to it. It's not like blue. I'm so excited. So many people got healed. Yeah, Pastor, but there was a whole lot of people in the church that didn't get healed. Yeah, but a lot of people got healed. Well, thank God we led somebody to Jesus today. Yeah, but there was like five people that rejected us and didn't want Christ. It's like, you just, it's a negative mentality. It's fear and intimidation. And, and that's a grasshopper mentality. Listen, if you, have a, if you have that kind of a negative spirit, it's easier to stir you up into anger and harder to stir you up into love. Like you can so easily get provoked into anger, but it's so hard for you to respond in love. It's easy when you live with a grasshopper mentality that you, that you live in fear and you have a hard time with forgiveness. There are people that just, they live with unforgiveness. Something bad happens in their life and now they're going to live their rest of their life in prison to the bad thing that happened and I refuse to forgive them so I don't even go to church anymore because I'm so mad at those people I don't even want to be around them. It's, it's a grasshopper spirit. If you're going to walk in faith, if you're going to walk with Jesus, you better learn one thing, and you better learn it well. You have to forgive everybody. You don't get to pick and choose who you're going to forgive. No matter what has happened or will happen in the future, you've got to be a person that says, a grasshopper mentality will not forgive, but I choose to forgive. And it is hard. I ain't trying to make it all easy. It's tough. But if you want to walk in faith and not fear, you have to forgive. If you have a grasshopper mentality, you become spiteful and you have a hard time operating in grace. It's a grasshopper complex. A a spirit of anger and fear will move you away from people instead of moving you towards people. That's the spirit of isolation. It's a grasshopper mentality. Number five, a grasshopper complex, a a grasshopper complex promotes the misuse of resources. I found it in here. When they left, when they left Egypt, when, when they left out of, the, out of the bondage of Pharaoh, and when they left, what was the last thing Pharaoh said? Go, go give them all the gold. Didn't he? 
So give them all the gold and silver. Let them take all the gold and silver with them. So God brings them out of the promised land with the resources. And what do they end up doing? What do they end up doing? They end up taking the gold and misusing it and melting it down and making a cow out of it. And now they're going to worship the cow. It's a misuse of resources. And this is, this, is what, this is what goes on in this cultural, in this world that we live in, this material world that we have created, this, this culture around us that says we got to have the best stuff so everybody's going to like us and know that we're doing okay. It's a misuse of resources. It's a grasshopper syndrome. It's amazing the number of things that people will spend money on when they're trying to get out of a hole. It's like you're trying to get out of a hole, trying to get your budget all straightened out, but you got to have the new iPhone. Listen, if you have an iPhone and it's working, you don't need the next model. I'm just saying. Period. Period. No, I got that. No, Pastor Greg, mine's an iPhone 7, but I need the 7 Plus, and now I got to have the 8 or the 8 Plus, or, or now I got to have the RX or the RXP Max or whatever. It is. The, I, I just got to have the latest phone because I, I just need that in my life. No, you, you, you're off track. You got a grasshopper mentality. Yeah, well, if you got a flip phone, you, if you got a flip phone or an Android, you need to update. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying, but, but, but this, this nonsense of, of you got to have the latest and greatest phone so you can be in with the crowd, it's a grasshopper mentality. Listen to me. If you, if you got a car and your stereo in your car costs more than your car, you got a grasshopper mentality. I'm rolling up 75, taking somebody to the airport yesterday, and I've got my cruise control on, and we're in the middle of a conversation, and a car rolls up behind me, and my windows start shaking. I'm doing 75 down the freeway. I'm looking at my car. So I thought the wheels were coming off or something. What in the world? I look in my mirror, and here's this young kid in a hoopty that I'm in duct tape holding the car together, and he flies by me at 85, rolling down like this. He can't even see the, out the window, and he's down there going sideways trying to get out. Your, your radio costs more than your car. you got a grasshopper mentality. He got rims on his car that cost more than the car. It's messed up. We've created a culture that has put the value of money in the wrong place. I'm just saying, this ain't just for the kids. This is for the adults, too. If your car costs more than your house, you got issues. You know I'm telling the truth. I ain't trying to meddle in nobody's business, but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. If you got more tattoos on your arm, if you've spent more on the tattoos on your arm than you have on your arm than you have in the savings account, you got a grasshopper mentality. Like somehow you can. I know how much they cost, and you're gonna have tattoos all down your arm, and you can't even pay your bills on time. It's a grasshopper mentality. Well, I got to have that. I, I mean, I got nothing against tattoos. I mean, I don't want one. I ain't had one. I can't think of anything I want to put on my body that I would like to have 10 years from now. I'm like, I, I just don't. I, but I ain't trying to give you a hard time if you got tattoos. But if you can't afford to put gas in your car and you up there letting them stick needles in your arm and put a, a scripture on there, it's like, are you serious? Well, I got the word tatted on my arm, but you can't even quote John 3:16. I've just got to go a little deeper in the grasshopper mentality because I want people to get it. I just want you to understand. Here's another thing. I'll tell you the grasshopper mentality. If you think you're going to get a job and you go show up, and hit, this guy owns his own business, and you show up at 4 o'clock and you get over there and say, hey, Jim, I'm looking to see if you'll hire me, man. I'm looking for a job. You ain't brushed your teeth all week. You're in shorts and a T-shirt trying to talk about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm looking for a job. You know what he's going to tell you? You need to go back home and get in bed, boy. I'm not going to hire That's a grasshopper mentality. Like you took a break from the video games to go see if somebody's going to hire you. Come on, Dan. You know I'm telling the truth. That's a grasshopper mentality. If you go for an interview, I'm just, I don't know why. If you go for an interview for a job 
And the first thing you ask the man interviewing you is, how much vacation time do I get? You might as well go home. Vacation is for after you've been working. It's a grasshopper mentality. Listen to me. I, 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 I understand you want to look good. I get it. But if you've got to go get your nails done, get your weave in, get your hair all done, and you've got to go through three credit cards to figure out which one's got enough money on it to pay for your weave and your hair and your nails, you've got a grasshopper mentality. Oh, man, that one's declining. Well, let's try this one and try that one. Surely there's got to be one of these cards that's got enough to get my nails. It's a grasshopper mentality. And people live that way. It's all about, oh, God, I get my tithe, and I know I gave my tithe, and I know God's going to bless me. No, God's going to, God needs to slap you upside the hand and say, stop living like that. Get yourself under the submission of the Holy Spirit and start living beneath your means. If you've been around long enough, you know there's times in your life when you've got to cut back. Huh? That don't mean nothing's bad. You've got to cut back. You're talking about, oh, but I know I can't afford it, but I look good. That's a grasshopper spirit. There are times in our lives where we've had to cut back and say, you know what? Ain't no shame in it. We can't afford that right now. We're not going to do that. Listen, we need a new couch at our house, but I refuse to go up to the store and put that couch on a credit card or get nine months same as cash so you don't even have to pay for it. You can hold on to it for nine months before you even have to make a payment and so that I can have a new couch so that if you come over to my house, you can sit in pastor's nice new couch. No, I'm sorry. Come over, sit on the floor like we do when you ain't there. Just come over and chill with us. I got a couch, but we bought it on Facebook Live the other day for 100 bucks. Got it in the couch. It's good. We can sit on that. Tim told me just now, Pastor Tim told me just now when I was in the office, he said, Pastor Greg, I'm so glad you preached that because I was just getting ready to go buy, buy a new flat screen, big screen TV so everybody that comes over to my house can watch it. He said, I don't need it. I'm fine. I watch my little TV. I'm good. He's got a big couch, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, if it, it, that grasshopper mentality has you thinking that somehow if you look the part and act the part, have a, that somehow you got status. But I want you to know something. Your character and integrity is far more important than your stuff. Far more important than your stuff. There's no shame in living within your means. There's no shame in with living within your means. There's nothing wrong with saying, I can't afford that right now, so I don't have it. No shame in it. We're raising up young people that, that have made it, we've normalized living in debt. We've just normalized it. It's normal. I was always in debt, so you always be in debt. When I don't read that in the scripture, the Bible said, oh, no man, nothing but to love him. And that ought to be our goal. If you're not there yet, it ought to be your goal to say, hey, in the next five years, I'm going to get myself out of debt and live within my means. Why? Because I don't want to carry this grasshopper mentality that was embedded into me as a child on into my future and drag my grandchildren along with me saying, look how Pop did it and do that. No. My dad refinanced his bills every three months. He'd go to beneficial finance and refinance all of his bills, put all of his bills into one bill so he'd have one low payment. He didn't understand he was mortgaging his future, and when he died, he owed more on his house than when he paid for it. But we were able to make it every day because we, I'm just telling you, we got to tear that mentality down. You are not grasshoppers. You have been made to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And you don't have to live at the bottom. You may be at the bottom today, but take your next step towards the top. God wants to set you free from a grasshopper mentality. Come on, give the Lord a praise, everybody. Two more. I'll close real quick. Two more. The grasshopper complex wants you to return to the familiar. When things get tough, it wants to make you return to the familiar. They were out there in the promised land, and they were and, and, and marching around the wilderness in the, in the wilderness and thinking and saying to themselves, we ought to go back to Egypt. At least we had leeks and garlic there. 
It's a mentality that says, you know what? When it gets tough, if we could just revert back to our old ways. God said, no, I brought you out of darkness into my light, and you are to walk forth in the power of God's love, and you are to set your, set your affections on things above. Last one. The grasshopper, the grasshopper syndrome always causes delayed development. Delayed development. They were at in the promised land, standing on the ground that God promised them they could have. And they listened to the lies of the enemy and said, we can't take those giants. After all the plagues and everything they'd been through, they still held on to a grasshopper mentality. And every one of them died in the wilderness and it was 40 years later before Joshua and Caleb entered into the promised land. Satan wants to delay your development, and you don't have to live with that. Miss Gail, if you'd come to the keyboard. God can do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever think or imagine. The Holy Spirit is greater than the grasshopper spirit. You don't have to live in bondage. Every time it comes up, man, because some of that stuff's deep-rooted into me. I, was, I lived in it my whole childhood. But every time it raises up, and every time I feel myself coming into a place where I said, that, God didn't call me to think that way. God didn't bring me up this far to leave me here. Every time I get ready to take this platform, and I get ready to stand up on the stage, and the enemy says to me, you can't lead it to where it needs to go. I hear those lies all the time. You're not a good enough communicator to actually take this church to where it needs to go. They're lies of the devil. It's the same lies that you hear, but it's just on a different level. You can't live healthy. You can't live healthy. You're getting older. You're always going to be sick. That's a lie from the devil. Well, you're just falling apart. The older you get, you're just falling apart. Now, I'm not falling apart. I'm falling into the love of God, and I'm walking in the, in the grace and the peace of God, and I know who I am in Christ, and no matter what it feels like, looks like, I'm going to make it through, Lily. I'm going to be what God's called me to be, and I'm going to celebrate the victories that God has given me because he is greater than all of my problems. Come on. Everybody stand up on your feet with me, please. Stand up on your feet. If you, uh, if you have the notes, if you get the notes, I put about 10 or 12 scriptures in there that you can focus on or print them out and put them on something for, just to help you deal with the grasshopper mentality. It's the year of the breakthrough. The lies of your bondage are not stronger than the promise. Kenneth Hagin wrote a quote, and I found it on the internet this week, and it says this, our confession will either imprison us or set us free. Our confession is the result of our believing. And our believing is the result of right or wrong thinking. And I declare over my life that I will keep right thinking in my head. I will keep decreeing and declaring God's truths over my life. And I will live in the land of the living. Come on, I will possess the land. I will take authority over the darkness that tries to creep in. I am not a grasshopper. I do not have a grasshopper mindset. I take authority over the grasshopper syndrome in my life and in my family and in my grandchildren. <laughs> Yesterday we were in the yard working and my grandson's six and I had the golf cart sitting right there. I said, Titus, look at me, buddy. I want you to get on that golf cart and I want you to hit the gas and I want you to go and turn in that big field and come back to pop. I got to load up all this stuff in the back of that golf cart. He said, Pop, I can't do that. I can't do that. I said, Titus, you're six years old, and I'm watching you, and if you listen to me, you can do that. He stood up on the golf cart, Winston, and put his foot on it, and just started taking off, and he jumped. He's looking around to see if his dad was around, because he thought he was going to get in trouble. He's like, I said, Titus, you're not going to get in trouble. Pop's telling you to do it. You can do this. Plus, he put his foot on it, and it started going. And I'm telling you, I, you, if you could have just seen his face, he was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. As soon as his dad got to the house, he goes, Dad, I drove the golf cart by myself. If you knew what your heavenly father was speaking over you, 
you can live in divine purpose. You can live with the calling over your life. You can do what you could not do on your own. But if you listen to his voice and obey his voice, there's nothing you can't get done. There's no mountain you can't climb. There's no valley you can't go through. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Hear and obey. You are not a grasshopper. In the name of Jesus. Everybody bow your hearts to the Lord right now. And I just speak into your life. If you're sitting here today and your relationship with God is not where it needs to be. And that's all needs to be said. I don't need to say, well, you're a sinner or, well, you're on your way to hell. I'm just telling you right now, if your relationship with God is not where it needs to be, I want you to lift your hands to God right now. Say, you know what? I am not where I need to be. I have wrong thinking in my head. I know I've not been living this the way I need to be living it. And I acknowledge that today. Just lift your hands all over the room. Hold them up real high where I can see them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Come on, there's others of you. You didn't lift your hand, but you know, man, things just aren't right. God says, hey, acknowledge it, and I'll help you. Acknowledge it, and I'll come to you. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. Others lift your hand and say, that's me. That's me. I know I'm not where I need to be. I've been listening to the wrong voices in my head. Anybody else lift it up right now? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, back. Thank you over here. Everybody lift your hands to Jesus right now. The Holy Spirit of God is in this room. Lift both hands to Jesus right now. And just open your heart and say to him, Jesus, I love you. I know you died for me. I give you my life. I give you control of my life. I want to love you forever. I want to be what you want me to be. I will not be defeated. I will not quit. I love you, Jesus. You died for me. Come on, say it. You died for me. I choose to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Everybody give the Lord a praise if you would. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just pray over the people today, Lord, as they go through their day, God, and this week, I pray that every time the grasshopper, the grasshopper syndrome tries to rise up, I thank you, Lord God, that we tear it down and we refuse to be who you have not called us to be. I speak the blessing over every young person in this room. I speak the blessing over every adult in this room. God, I thank you for this Father's Day. May it be the best Father's Day ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you more than pizza, everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.